somebody's laying an egg over there right now, as you can hear. Uh, so in this area, we've got a bunch more alpine strawberries. I have an iris with edible roots, um, lovage, Turkish rocket, Welsh onions, a number of interesting perennial vegetables. This one over here is one of my favorites. This is a native um, giant Solomon seal that has a really nice asparagus-like shoot in the spring. And this will grow in sun or shade. But we also have real asparagus as well, which certainly is one of the finest perennial vegetables for this area. This isn't the best time of year to eat a lot of perennial vegetables, but you can see them very nicely. This is a bamboo. We have three different bamboo species here in the garden. Uh, this is yellow groove bamboo, which you can tell actually has a yellow groove every other section of the column. That's the only way I can identify it. Um, and we grow these for the edible shoots, and also they make great tomato steaks, privacy screen, and a little bit of evergreen foliage for the, for the winter. We do have a rhizome barrier, sort of like a fence underground that helps prevent them from running and spreading into the rest of the garden because we like to grow other things too. Um, back here is one of my very favorite perennial vegetables. This is called Fuki. Uh, it's from Japan and as you can see it has very large leaves. The main edible crop on this is the leaf stalk. In the spring when they're still tender you chop them up and boil them for about 10 minutes and then you peel off the outer fiber and it's a really nice vegetable. So this is a great crop. It grows in the wet shade. There's no annual vegetable that's going to grow in wet shade but Fuki will do it extremely well. Sometimes almost too well. We also have in this area over here uh, Udo, which is another perennial vegetable from Japan. It's used like asparagus, and it has extraordinarily beautiful flowers that at this point are making little berries. These flowers are wildly attractive to wasps, and this will grow eventually up to about 10 feet tall. It's quite a large vegetable. This one over here is a mimosa tree, uh, which fixes nitrogen, uh, grows extremely well. This is all growth from one season right here. We're at the very northern limit of growing mimosa. If you drive 20 minutes north of here, you'll see these dying back in the winter. Um, we like it not only for the nitrogen fixation, but also because the flowers are the favorite flower of the ruby-throated hummingbird, which, though a native hummingbird, prefers the flowers of this tree over anything else. So, uh, and we like to have hummingbirds not just because they're beautiful, not just because they're pollinators, but also because they, uh, in the spring, they eat huge amounts of insects so they're good for pest control as well. These are Josta berries again, which, uh, which grow in the shade. So they're in partial shade back here and they produce pretty well. That's a really nice fruit, kind of sour, but I like them. We've got an Asian pear, which has three varieties grafted on it. And when you're in a very limited space situation, like a backyard garden in a city, this way you have your pollinator right there on the same tree, so you only need one tree. And even at full size, this will only be about 12 feet across, 15 feet high. So we'll be able to have um, an early season, mid season and late season pear growing all in one tree. And they are really very delicious and very low maintenance as well. This is an area where we have some low bush blueberries and other acid loving plants getting established. And uh, this is our uh, fall raspberry crop coming in, which are um, not maybe the best time to eat them, but there's no really bad time to eat a raspberry. We've also got golden raspberries over here as well. And the nice thing about the golden raspberries is not only do they have extraordinary flavor, but they also confuse birds because birds think that a red raspberry is ripe and a yellow raspberry is unripe. 